Mm-hmm. Oh, hello. Welcome once again to Stuff and Things, where I like to talk about stuff and occasionally even things. I'm your good friend, Bradley, and today is a very pleasant Sunday Stuff and Things, and on this pleasant Sunday Stuff and Things, we have stuff and things to talk about, including upcoming videos, things that you can look forward to on Stuff and Things and working. We're going to have some spam corrections. <laughs> I had so many responses from the spam thing. I was not expecting that at all. I didn't realize people would have such strong feelings about spam. But we have some info. We'll, we'll get into the feedback for the spam segment when we get into your hashtag Ask Stuff and Things section. But my mom also contacted me with some feedback about the spam section or segment as well. We're going to talk about something that I came across that I found kind of weird. The phenomena of putting bunny ears behind somebody when they're getting their picture taken. Just some weird information I found out about that. And then, of course, we have your questions, comments, and feedback in hashtag Ask Stuff and Things. So let's get into it. Okay, what can you look forward to on Stuff and Things and working? Well, this coming week, we are finally going to do the unboxing of my custom pair of NYX Pullman Engineer boots. I've been waiting for these for a long time. I am very excited to show them to you. I'll give you a little preview. They look amazing. They're fantastic. So wait till this Wednesday, you'll see me unbox those boots. I was very, very worried about the fit. You'll be able to see in that video whether or not they did fit me correctly and just all the cool features of these boots. They're just absolutely fantastic. So that's coming up this week. The week after, we will do the full review of Capstan Gold Navy Cut. And then we will do a video the following week where I go over the first two rolls of film that I shot with my Nikon FE, my beautiful vintage film camera that Diamond got for me for my birthday. I shot one roll of color, that was Kodak Ultramax 400, and then I shot a roll of black and white, which was Kodak Tri-X 400. Send them away to a place called thedarkroom.com, and I'll tell you right now, did not get very many good pictures, but it's not the camera. The camera's working fine. I learned a lot through the experience um, of shooting those two rolls of film. There's going to be a bit of a learning curve for me because I haven't really ever shot film with a manual camera. Back Way back in the day, I had a point-and-shoot camera that I shot 35 millimeter film on <clears throat> that had autofocus and, you know, auto everything. But getting into, even though you may know the theory of proper exposure, the exposure triangle, shutter speed, ISO, aperture, all that stuff, actually putting it into the real analog world of film is very different than shooting on a digital camera where you can put bump the ISO up to, you know, 6400 and it still looks fine. You can't do that on a film camera. So it's been a learning experience. I'm excited to get more film shot and to get it processed, but check that video out, which will be the third video on Stuff and Things. So we have unboxing Nick's Custom Pullman Engineer Boots this week, Capstan Gold full review the next week, and then my first two rolls of 35 millimeter film the week after. And then this Friday, we have a new episode of Working. It's Working Episode 23, Mono Pouring a Foundation on an Island, and also a little fender bender that occurred when we were doing that pour. So check that out, Working Episode 23 this Friday on Working. Lots of good stuff. Okay, so last week I was kind of at loose ends wondering what I was going to talk about on the Sunday video, and so I bought a can of Spam, thinking, I've never had Spam, let me crack this open, take a couple bites, and talk about it. Was not expecting the firestorm of comments that resulted after that. Got hundreds of comments, well not hundreds, but well over a hundred comments on people remarking on spam, uh, talking about their experience with experiences with spam, the proper way to prepare spam, was not expecting that people had such strong feelings about spam. And I'll get to your comments when we get to hashtag ask stuff and things, but I had some comments from my own mother who texted me. I always forget that people in my family watch my Sunday videos sometimes. And this is what she said. <clears throat> this was on Monday. We had spam a lot when you were growing up. It was economical at the time. I would get a couple of cans, score the tops, top with pineapple, and stick in clothes. Cheaper than getting a ham. So you have actually had it a lot. And you liked it. Are you going to correct this next week? 
And one thing, you are getting all the congealed juices at the top. If it is cooked, it tastes more like ham. Okay, so I respond, and it's like, weird, I have absolutely no memory of that at all. And then she says that my dad loves Spam sandwiches. She said she always scraped off the juice if I made sandwiches, but not if I was cooking it. So first of all, the Spam can that I had did not have any of the congealed jelly that people talk about on the top. I think maybe that was back in the day. I don't know that that's on Spam anymore. And second, I have no memory of ever eating Spam in my entire life. So either, either she's thinking of my brother, which I'm not sure. I'm sure she'll correct me again if she sees this. Or I was just so young that it made no impression on me and I don't remember it. But I literally never, ever remember Spam passing my lips. So I guess I'm a liar. I trust my mom, but not really because I honestly don't have any memory of it. And the taste of the Spam the first time I dipped my fork in there and took a bite was definitely not something that seemed familiar to me whatsoever. When we get to the actual feedback from the spam segment, I can't believe we're talking about spam so much, I'll uh, talk a little bit more about my feelings on spam. So, an important correction I thought I had to make. So, many of you may have seen pictures in which somebody's wise-ass friend has placed their two fingers behind their friend's head in this gesture, which when I was a kid we called the bunny ears and sort of an old way of photobombing people. I've never actually done it, but you know, I've seen it done a lot. People go, hey, they put it behind the head. And I always assumed that was a fairly recent phenomena, but I was watching a video today on YouTube actually, when I'm supposed to be doing other things, wasting time on YouTube. And it was just, um, I think it was rare photos from the set of classic films. And so they were showing behind the scenes photographs from a lot of classic films from the golden age of Hollywood and there was a picture of Marlon Brando on the set of On the Waterfront, which I think was 54 or 55, somewhere around there. And Carl Malden, his co-star, was behind him doing the bunny ears, like, eh, to Marlon Brando. And I thought, okay, that's weird. I didn't realize that people have been doing that for so long. I'll show you the picture here. You can see Marlon Brando looking... Seem seemingly unaware what's going on, and Carl Malden giving him the bunny ears behind him. So I thought, okay, when did the whole bunny ears thing start? So I did some research, and I found out now, granted, this is information that I found on the internet, and so it may not be completely accurate. There are a lot of apocryphal, just plain wrong things where people try to kind of back explain things from the past using modern knowledge, and it's often nonsense, but this seems fairly likely, where basically the bunny ears started way, way back, hundreds of years ago. I think people were saying it was popularized in Italy, and it was a way of other men making fun of men that they, were th that they thought had been cuckolded, where their wife had played away. And so they would give them the cuckold horns behind their head. They might be out in public, and old uh, Giovanni would get up behind and would give the cuckold horns to the unaware Giuseppe, and everyone would smirk and snigger behind their backs. And the thing that kind of lends this credence is I found a painting, it was called Actors of the Comedie de l'Art from Francois Buñuel, and it portrays somebody giving the bunny ears to somebody, and this painting was from the late 1500s, early, or late 16th century. And if that's true, that's fascinating, because that means that that meaning, it went from, uh -huh, your wife's been cheating on you, maybe it, when it first started it was actually, oh, we really do think this, and then it sort of morphed into, ha ha, that's kind of a snide, disrespectful thing to do somebody, we may not know anything about your personal life, but we're going to do that behind your head. And then it morphed from that into just a funny thing, and all the meaning from that is gone now, I've never heard anyone refer to it or talk about it as though it was referring to someone having their wife cheat on them or their partner. The funny thing is, is I can imagine, <clears throat> obviously I'm assuming Francois Buñuel just did that in the painting when he had people posing for him. I doubt that Giuseppe was there behind Giancarlo doing the bunny ears and Giuseppe's like, why is everybody smirking? And they're standing there for hours and hours and he turns around and, and Giancarlo puts his 
his fingers down and the painter's like, oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's fine. And then when he turns around again, he's doing this and it's for hours and hours at a time. It works a lot better when you're taking a picture. I can't imagine somebody actually pranking someone in a, in a painting. They've been standing for 10 hours, 12 hours. And then when they get the painting back, what? Look what you did. But I just thought that was really funny. If that's true, I think it's interesting that doing the bunny ears to somebody in a picture can trace its roots all the way back to maybe the 16th, maybe the 15th century. Fascinating stuff. But now gang, it is time for hashtag ask stuff and things. Remember, if you have a question for me and you would like it answered on the Sunday stuff and things, tweet at XAT, SAT Bradley with the hashtag ask stuff and things. If you are a Patreon supporter, you can write to me via Patreon and go right to the front of the line. Or if you hit that super thanks button under this video, you can go right to the front of the line and you can just leave questions, comments, and feedback in the comment section of my YouTube videos. First, we have some feedback from last week's Sunday stuff and things. Now, I have picked a sample of these responses because there were so many about the spam. A lot of people were talking about where spam, the actual name comes from. So this is from, uh, at, oh, at Sir Winston Churchill. Oh, it's nice that Sir Winston has decided to chime in here. Sir Winston Churchill says, spiced ham equals spam. At John Walker 91 said, special processed American meat equals spam. And at Akronov, spam, some parts are meat. Obviously a little more uh, jokey definition of what spam means. I looked it up. Apparently the Hormel Foods Corporation once said that it means shoulder of pork and ham, but in some dictionaries, spam means spiced ham. Members of staff at the Spam Museum say it stands for specialty, specially produced American meat. And in 2019, Spam began making advertisements containing the definition sizzle pork and mmm. So if Hormel says, or once said, and this was way in the past that it means shoulder of pork and ham, I'm inclined to believe that as the origin, but who knows? It could be specially produced American meat. It could be spiced ham. I don't know if we know definitively. We have the, or no, I hate Z, what? I hate Zidiots. Okay, dude, no one eats it right out, of the, right out of the can. I live in Hawaii and have been eating it all my life. You need to fry it at least. It also works great in corn chowder. Cube it and fry it with bacon and add the rest to make the chowder. My niece once said it's made out of butts, nuts, and guts. I know that you don't just spoon it up out of the can or fork it up out of the can, but I just thought that would be funnier and more entertaining for the video. I wasn't going to bring a hot plate in here and like fry my spam up for you to see. I wanted it to be a little more spontaneous and fun. A lot of people were berating me for eating it out of the can, but that was kind of the point of the video. Next we have at Bull Moose Piper 7732. Seriously, you're an American and have never had spam? Well, apparently I have, but I have no memory of it. That's stunning. No one I know eats Spam cold. You should pan fry it, barbecue it, grill it, roast it, mix it with eggs, anything but cold. I believe the name Spam comes from shoulder of pork and ham, which is what uh, Hormel agrees with there. Spam is the best-selling canned meat in the world. There are no organs in Spam. If you watch how it's made, Hormel insists they make it from pork shoulder only. I really enjoyed watching this. Cheers, Bradley. At Talkin' T says, Bradley, like most of the other comments mentioned, you have to slice it up and then fry it crispy. You have to do a revisited now after frying. Maybe I'll do that. Again, I didn't realize people would have such strong feelings about spam. At Hexeter Bonsai says, just curious, curious, Bradley, knowing that Diamond is in the film industry, how much of the influence have, how much of an of an influence have you been on one another, do you think? Given your renewed interest in photography, has it given you any new insights? I'm curious to know how you may have taken inspiration from one another. As far as spam goes, my family was not well off when I was younger and spam alongside corned beef in a similar tin were staples in our household. As many others have suggested, it is a good, it is good fried, reminded me a lot of salty bologna. <laughs> bologna, bologna. I don't understand why Americans pronounce that that way, bologna which was also pan fried when we ate it. If you chip it down and pan fry it in bits with some hash browns, it is actually a decent meal, quite hearty. Um, a lot of stuff going on with your comment here, Hexeter Bonsai. Um, yeah, I'd say that Diamond and I have influenced each other as far as my videography stuff. I, I did some creative projects with videography in the past and actually with film when I was in college, we shot Super 8 and 16 millimeter stuff. 
and did editing, but I guess she has kind of reignited that for me because we've been working on projects together. And as far as me influencing her, maybe, I'm not sure. Um, she's expressed some interest in photography, maybe pursuing that a little bit. But yeah, we definitely have, it's, it's impossible not to rub off on each other a little bit. And then, uh, yeah, we weren't well off when I was a kid either. And we definitely went to the food bank and got that government cheese and the powdered milk and all that stuff. But I just, I don't remember the spam. Maybe I was just way too young when we were in our spam phase. I don't know. All right, now we have some feedback from the first impressions of Capstan Gold video. A lot of people were really excited to see me feature this blend. We have at Shakana, who's actually our good friend Scottum, left me a super thanks. Thank you, Scottum. Scottum says, good afternoon, Bradley. Sorry I've been MIA for some time. My oldest daughter was married last week and life has been a whirlwind. Congratulations. Thank you for the review. There are, it's a first impressions video. There are, these are the type of blends I lean towards. A topping that adds a bit of sweetness. Some people are saying bergamot, but doesn't dominate. It's, it's a very citrusy flavor, but I'm not sure exactly what citrus. Uh, but doesn't dominate as the only flavor on the palate. Really enjoy blends like Exhausted Rooster or, Rooster or PS Fourth Generation 2012 Flake. Cheers, my friend, Scott M. Thank you, Scott M. At Tom Brown, 1898. <clears throat> Bradley, back in the late 90s, I went through a period of trying various Virginia flakes at the urging of a young man who worked at a pipe shop. I even bought two little Savinelli Foursquare billiards in which to smoke them. The Capstan Blue and Gold were among the blends I tried along with the, Dunhill, with the Dunhill's Light Flake. Don't remember anything about the Capstan Flakes other than, that, other than that they were very pleasant. The Dunhill Flake was a keeper. They all had the bright citrus flavor I really like now and then with an occasional tea note. Great show today. I don't know if I've ever had Light Flake. I think I may have had it, but I can't remember. It was back in the day when I was having all sorts of Dunhill blends. I'm not even sure. Yeah, I think I may have had Light Flake. I've definitely had tons of their normal flake, and that is, to me, a really quintessential straight Virginia. A light, citrusy, hay, grassy, uh, just perfect straight Virginia flake, in my opinion. At XX Liberty or Death XX, I can't believe the price of this stuff jumped simultaneously on all the major online retailers from $16 to $21 a few weeks ago. That's a wild jump. Even with the occasional 15 to 20% discount some stores provide, that's just bringing it back down to the previous price level. So many other options at half the price point that are similar or better. I'm not sure what MacBaron was thinking here. Yeah, I kind of agree. It's kind of crazily expensive compared to a lot of other similar blends. At Paul the Scandinavian, 4992 says, Thanks for the first impressions. Personally, I prefer this over the blue tint. The blue one. Especially in the summer season. This reminds me of the OGS... Uh, he's got a lot of stuff crossed out here, which is interesting. Minus Preak. Also, this Capstan Yellow provides some end past half bowl smoke, so it's not that light when one may think. Rather light to medium in Nick department. I look forward to watching your main video of this product. Thanks. Yeah, and that's kind of what my impression of Capstan Gold was, is just sort of a light version of blue, but we'll definitely be getting into that more when I do the full review. So thank you for all the feedback, gang. Please keep it coming in. It really helps make the show go. But now, it's time for the very best part of the show, and that is where we thank our Patreon supporters. Remember, if you would like to support the channels on Patreon, there is a link in the description box below, and it is much appreciated. It helps pay for the fancy camera that is filming this video, the lights that are shining upon me, blends and products for review, things that I can show you, bring to you on the channel, and it is much, much appreciated. And every week we like to shout out those who support the channels at $25 or more a month. People like Glenn Dunnington, Jason Buckner, David Godrew, Ryan McFadden, Arcturus, Ashes of the Phoenix, and Jonathan Proctor. And of course, the maniacs, the crazy people who support the channels at $100 a month. People like Bob McGee. And we'll never forget our dearly departed friend and Hall of Fame member, Peter Straub. Remember, we're still in the middle of a drive for $105 supporters. So if you would like to support the channels, if you like what we do here, there is a link in the description box below, as I mentioned. Gang, there is so much coming up on these channels. Just did a weird twitch there, not sure why. Please stay tuned for all the good stuff. I have so many videos in the queue. People keep suggesting things for me to do, and I'm like, okay, but I've got about 12 different videos, some of which I've already recorded. I've got just so much that I want to get ready and show to you on this channel. 
I've never gotten bored, and that's fun. It's cool that we can just do these things. It's that old thing that people keep saying, is if you want to be successful on YouTube, you need to pick one thing and focus solely on that one thing. I have never done that, which I think has contributed to the fact that this channel still only has about 52,000 subs after all this time. And a lot of those subs, I think, are ghost subs because they'll find a video on fountain pens and they'll subscribe and then they realize, oh, well, the channel isn't just about fountain pens, so I don't want to watch anymore. Or they'll find a video on uh, a pipe blend and subscribe and then find out, oh, well, it's not just about that. But that's kind of the thing that I like about the channel. And I know it maybe limits the success and maybe limits my ability to actually make a living doing this. I would love to make a living doing this, but I have eclectic tastes, and I think the people who really are loyal to this channel have eclectic tastes too. And I don't want to just chase views or chase what I think might be more popular. I want to stay interested, and I think if I only did videos on one thing, I would lose interest. So anyway, thank you so much for being loyal, supporting the channel, and I look forward to seeing you again. Until next time, until we meet again, I've been your good friend Bradley. You've been the audience. This has been Stuff and Things on a very pleasant Sunday Stuff and Things. I'll see you later.